Welcome to Inside South Union Township here on the South Union Township Network. Inside South Union Township is brought to you as a joint cooperative venture featuring Township Supervisors Bob Schiffbauer, Rick Vernon and Jason Scott, Atlantic Broadband Cable, Armstrong Cable, and our friends at CUTV, including Gary Smith. We're continuing our COVID-19 series. Joining us here today, Roy Shipley. He's the Fayette County Emergency Management Agency Director and Jimmy Bittner, the Planning and Training Officer. And guys, thank you very much for joining us here on the South Union Township Network. Uh, thanks for inviting us. We're uh, happy to come and share the information that needs to get out to the public. And certainly uh, some crazy times going on right now. This coronavirus pandemic really has affected everyone. Yes, it has. Uh, as you know, the... Uh, the uh, governor put the stay at home for all 67 counties now, and I think uh, maybe all counties but one might have or does have a, uh, a case or two. And uh, we're up to what today, 20. Jimmy? We're up to 20 in Fayette County today. And we're actually taping this on April the 3rd, and we actually have five new cases today. Yes. We have uh, 20 cases and uh, one death from the coronavirus. That was reported this past Wednesday and obviously one of the things that we're practicing here on set and I think you're hearing a lot about in the media is social distancing. Yes and uh, everybody needs to practice that and uh, you know with uh, as we had talked before going on the air here we're, that, that's, we're concerned with that being nice weather and the weekend and people getting out. People still you know we want people to get out and get that exercise if they want to hit the trails or walk, but they still need to practice that social distancing and do it in a safe manner and adhere to what the authorities and the governor and the commissioners and everybody has been telling everybody. Do you think we're doing enough of it here in the county? I think we are, yes. We're trying to get the word out. We're trying to push it out through the, our, our media sources from emergency management through the commissioners and now through the South Union Supervisors, and we thank them for that, and you guys through the, your networks. So, you know, but we just got to keep stressing them. From the Emergency Management Agency, what precautions are you recommending at this time? Well, I think one of the big things is uh, we, we've spoke to a lot of local municipalities, we've asked questions about how they can better help doing it. One of the things I know the city of Uniontown, um, city of Connorsville, South Connorsville Borough, Recently, this last week, uh, they overtook the closing of all their parks within the municipality um, by taping them off with caution tape, putting barricades up, um, and basically just making sure that they limit that social distancing, people playing ball in the parks, um, organized sports teams practicing. We know we're getting reports of that from, from different people um, that they're out playing baseball, uh, practicing baseball and things. So uh, we, we really want to get that word out that social distancing is important, trying to keep people off of the the parks and things. Um, you know, our big concern, one of the things we've been addressing is Ohio Powell, places like that. Uh, we know the parks are open, we know the trails are open, but uh, when you look on social media specifically and you see somebody posting a picture of Ohio Powell and, and you see 500 people standing in a group, that's not social distancing. Yeah, so, and you, st you still have an opportunity to exercise and right. be safe at the same time. Obviously, we have a nice sheepskin trail which goes right through Absolutely. South Indian Township. Walked it with my family last night, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just it's a great thing. Um, to, the trails need to be open and things like that because people are going to need to get out of their house a little bit. Um, but they can do it by socially distancing too. So and of course, business-wise, we do have a number of essential businesses in the county, nationwide, of course, that are still open. What can the businesses that are open do to assist with social distancing right now? I think one of the big things, um, especially the larger box stores, uh, there's been a lot of discussion of that, what they can do. And I noticed some of them have started to put some, uh, some things into place now. Uh, but limiting their hours, obviously, of when they're opening, limiting the number of people coming in and out of the store at, at a given time. I know uh, some people have said some of the stores that have two entrances to them have locked that down to one entrance, so they're controlling the number of people coming in and out of the stores. I actually time. saw a Walmart in Hawaii this past week actually were limiting customers to 50 in at a time. Yeah. So and I think we might see more and more of that in here as well. And I actually saw Target might be starting to do the same thing. Yeah, I know. Uh, I saw something Home Depot starting that, instituting that practice now too. And I think that's very important because as many of the small businesses, the non-essentials, they were forced to shut down. I think more of the spread is actually occurring from the grocery stores and from some of the bigger box stores out there as well. Yeah. Correct. Is there anything we can do other than just trying to limit hours and limit the number of people in the store, maybe cut down on X? Obviously, groceries are an essential need, but by the same token, 
you don't want this to just keep on spreading because people are going out and, and doing their shopping. Well, I think if people as much as possible, they need to, you know, make that one trip. Don't make it a habit to go just because they want to get out to go every day to Walmart to pick up the groceries. You know, make the trip, and if you can go every week or every other week, and you, you're you're able to do that, to do th do things like that to limit you being in the store, as as you said, the more people are are uh, you know visiting a facility like that, the more chances are that somebody takes it in and somebody then spreads it. And we're starting to see, of course, more of that spread here in the area. You mentioned up to 20 cases in the area. If if somebody does start to come down with some symptoms. From an emergency management perspective, what are you recommending right now? When's the best time to call the doctor? When's the best time maybe to go for an outpatient test? They've obviously set up the testing center in the old Kmart location up there. And, of course, the Union Town Hospital also available for testing as well inside their facilities for more serious cases. I think one of the best things is um, obviously calling your, your PCP first on the phone. Um, unless you're experiencing some type of a emergency medical condition, so the shortness of breath, uh, symptoms. If you've just developed a dry cough, um, you've developed a fever, a low-grade fever, um, would be calling your PCP first and then talking to them and asking them what you should do. If you do call 911, um, there, are, there is a chance that EMS is going to come out, evaluate you, um, communicate with their medical command physician, and they're going to recommend that you treat at home, um, that you stay home and you isolate yourself um, and monitor those symptoms. But obviously, um, the big thing is um, the shortness of breath starts to occur, things like that. Uh, chest pains, uh, you want to call 911 for that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, the PCPs can write the script for you to be tested if they think that you meet the criteria that need to be tested. Um, and a lot of that's going to be based on those symptoms that you are experiencing. You mentioned the first responders coming out. I have to think that they have to take a number of precautions as well because you don't know what type of a situation you're going to be walking right. into. Right, and that's developed and, and evolved over the last, uh, last few weeks. Um, we started about three weeks ago planning uh, what we were going to do with our EMS folks and, and meeting their request for resources. Uh, and that's actually quadrupled um, over the last about two weeks. Uh, we actually do a conference call weekly now with our EMS providers in the county uh, with their agency directors and managers. We talk to them about what PPE needs that they have right now, what are they seeing. We're also participating with uh, our major hospitals that have their command facilities as well and getting ideas of what they're changing constantly. Uh, we started this with a, just a surgical mask on the provider going into the house to now we're wearing an N95 filtering mask on the responders for every patient contact. Uh, so they go to a vehicle accident, it's not going to be uncommon to see that responder show up with an N95 mask on just because you were involved in a vehicle accident because they don't know. Uh, their guidance today is treat every patient as if they have it. It's, especially with the outbreak that we're seeing, I mean, statewide, I think there are over uh, 1,200 to 1,400 new cases a day over the last uh, few days later on this week. Right. And as we get that updated information, as Jim, as Jim said, from the uh, medical command and the, the hospitals, we're pushing that information out on a daily basis to the EMS. And if they have questions and concerns, we're trying to help them get those questions answered because they are out there every day on the front line. You talked about the EMS people protecting themselves. What could you do inside of your house to make sure that you're well protected as well, especially if we continue to have the surge in cases like we have over the last couple of weeks? So just, uh, you mentioned we're doing this on, on April the 3rd. Uh, the president, or the, uh, the governor today in his press conference, um, along with uh, the Secretary of Health, recommended people, if you do leave your house, wearing a, uh, some type of a, a mask over your face, um, just basically to protect yourself more than anything, so that if you do have the symptoms or you, and you don't know that you're carrying it, um, that you're not spreading it to other people. And that doesn't have to be a medical grade mask, that can be something as small as a bandana, um, just to protect yourself if you're going out um, from other people. And, and basically, so that if you are spreading it, you're not spreading it to other people. Um, so those emergency cases where you do have to go out to, to get groceries, go to the, um, the doctors, things like that, obviously those are the reasons that that we look at that. So even wearing a bandana, you would consider that safe because it seems like talking to people around the community, the one thing I'm hearing is you can't find any masks anymore. Right, yeah, and, and that's what the, the governor said today. Uh, obviously, they want to leave the, the medical masks for the medical providers because um, they don't want to get into a position where we have none available for our EMS providers and our hospital staff uh, and those that need them. And it seemed like when this first outbreak occurred over maybe three weeks ago, we thought we'd mainly see a surge in cases from the elderly. But we've certainly seen that transition where now we're seeing cases from every age group. And it seems like even over the last couple of weeks, we're seeing more cases from folks maybe 18 to 60 
than some of the cases from maybe folks 70 and above. Yeah, I think uh, one of the big problems was when a lot of the data was coming out from China and Italy and then the Pennsylvania and, and the U.S., um, they were trying to show graphs of where the affected population was going to be at. And I think one of the main things was uh, when you looked at the raw data and you started to put it together, the affected population of uh, ages 25 to 49 is where we see the majority of the cases right now. But where we're seeing the majority of the hospitalization is that age 65 and over population. So I think that age 65 and over population number, people were seeing that 49% or, or 60%, and they were thinking, well, it's the old people that are going to get it and the old people that are going to get sick, when reality was it's the, the elderly population that was going to end up in the hospital from it. Uh, the younger people were going to have a better time fighting it off, and those that didn't have pre-existing medical conditions. But I think as time's changing, they're seeing that the more cases, because I think if you look to social distancing, it's your younger population that's really the ones that are out and about more than your older population. And so you must think at first that a lot of the younger population, we saw that for maybe some of the spring break trip uh, info we saw down in Florida where folks were all together on the beach and you know trying to party during spring break, that the younger generation kind of thought they were invincible during the whole break. Yeah, and I think that was because of the original data that came yeah, out. Right. We're seeing that, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I think that led to it. As of today, for, for Pennsylvania, 20, age 25 to 49 is at 19%. 50 to 64 age is 28. And 65 plus is up to 50%. And then the, uh, but the positive test that have come back is 8,420. But there's almost 54,000 negative tests come back in relevant to the numbers of the tests. So, you know. and I think it's hard as well because there are a lot of folks that might have it that aren't showing that many symptoms, so you really don't know and they the may amount, never of, be of, tested. Of, yeah, amount of prevalence yeah. that there is. There's, there's going to be more cases out there than what actually tests positive and shows up in the numbers. Right. And of course, you know, for any, anybody out there, they want to stay well informed, but I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks folks obtain information from non-reliable sources, whether it's fake Facebook links to websites, a lot of hearsay out there, or just talking to Joe on the street. You never know. Right. Um, you know, everybody has their conspiracy theories out there, but I know one of the things you guys wanted to pass along was where they can find reliable and, of course, correct information. They could go to the, yes, uh, they could go to the Fayette County website, and on there there's a bright yellow block up in the corner of the COVID-19. They click on that. And there'll be links on there that where they can get information pertaining to what they're, you know, looking for. For whether it's a business, an individual, uh, you know, we're, ha we're we're breaking that down as we speak and, and putting trying to put all the current information up there where they can go, you know, what uh, where they can go to get additional information, questions and answer sessions from the PA Department of Health, from the governor's office, from you know, state emergency management from uh, the, gov the president's uh, information that they're putting out from the uh, federal task force, from FEMA. We're putting, we're trying to break that down so it'll be a one-stop shop. They can go on there, and what they're looking for, click on it, and it'll be right there. Pass along that website address again. It's, it's. I just Google the Fayette County. Okay. Fayette County website. I believe it's uh, Fayette County P. It's FayetteCountyPA.org. Okay. Yeah. yeah. FayetteCountyPA.org. And you guys are very active on Facebook and social media as well. That's correct. We try to push everything out on our, our kind of EMA uh, social media sites. And of course, as you said, you've made a lot of upgrades to your website within the last week or so, actually still in the process of making some of those upgrades. So if the folks haven't visited you over the last week or two, check it out because a lot, a lot, of, a lot more information on there and I think broken down a lot easier for folks to navigate. Right. That's correct. And, and again... Uh, we're trying to put things on there for businesses and, and other uh, entities that may have questions about, you know, the federal uh, stimulus package and, and other things. Yeah, we're talking to Roy Shipley, Fayette County Emergency Management Agency Director, and Jim Bittner, the Planning and Training Officer for the Fayette County Emergency Management Agency. You're watching Inside South Union Township here on the South Union Township Network, and we'll have more in just a moment. Davis and Davis, attorneys at law. Every person who's been injured, when they come in, has an expectation that their case is important, and it is to us. We take 
these cases very seriously. So that experience that we have is unique also because we have experience in these communities, in Uniontown, in Washington, in Waynesburg, in these court systems. You don't have to go to Pittsburgh to be represented by attorneys who don't know their way around your community. Davis and Davis, Attorneys at Law. Welcome back to Inside South Union Township here on the South Union Township Network, continuing our COVID-19 program series, which is actually being run if you've had an opportunity to check out Atlantic Broadband Channel 17 or Armstrong Channel 61. All of our interview programming being aired currently on a loop right now. If you have access to either of those two cable systems, you can also watch any of our programming on demand anytime on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and search South Union Television. You can also follow the South Union Township Network on Facebook as well for program updates. That's facebook.com slash South Union TV. Again, we're talking COVID-19 here today with Roy Shipley, Fayette County Emergency Management Agency Director, and Jimmy Bittner, the Planning and Training Officer for the Fayette County Emergency Management Agency. And guys, we've been talking a lot about protective equipment, and you mentioned earlier about the governor today asking all residents if they're outside to make sure that they're wearing masks as well. But I think one of the questions a lot of people have is cross-contamination out there as well. You wear a mask, you wear gloves. What's the best way to make sure that you're not getting that spread and, and keeping that uh, protective equipment sanitary? Yeah, so um, you know, some of the observations we've seen and, and we've been talking to other people about over the last few days, specifically last week, uh, people going to the grocery store and they're wearing a pair of rubber gloves and they put those rubber gloves on when they get out of their car and then they go up and they open, uh, they pick up the buggy and they walk it through pushing the buggy and then they pick up something off the shelf and they're looking at it and they put it back on the shelf and obviously they're protecting their hands but what they don't realize they're doing is everything they've touched now, they're contaminating that and then somebody else comes and picks up that product. So just, you know, we, we've watched people, um, they go into Walgreens or, or another store and they come out and they take their gloves off and they dispose of them in the parking lot. Um, so you're, you're really, really spreading that contamination now out there and, and the public's not safer by any means when that happens. So uh, you're just giving people tips of making sure they dispose of their gloves properly, uh, making sure that if they are going to wear gloves, um, that they're you know, not picking stuff up, putting it back on the shelves, things like that. Um, you know, and then obviously when you go home, cleaning off the stuff that you just bought at the store, wiping the cans off, um, rinsing them off, things like that uh, goes a long way. Um, and it really helps with it. The, the known information we've seen from the coronavirus um, with COVID-19 is that it can live on surfaces up to three to five days in some areas, depending on the surface. Uh, so obviously that becomes a concern for you, um, that if somebody had something on their body and then touched something, it's now been transferred onto that. Um, you know, it doesn't live as long in the air as it does on, on items. So uh, those are just things we have to tell people to, to make sure that they're protecting themselves properly and not cross-contaminating as they're doing things. I know myself, even when I pump gas, I'll, uh, now I'll catch myself with a pair of gloves on, just touching that handle because you don't know somebody before you did. But then when you're done pumping gas, obviously taking that glove off before you open your car door now so you're not cross-contaminating it. So um, those little, little tidbits help. A lot. Yeah, we actually had Dr. James on with us from the Union Town Hospital a few days ago here on South Union Township, uh, the uh, South Union Township Network and inside uh, South Union TV. And he actually mentioned that sometimes it's better not to wear the gloves and just make sure you're washing your hands on a regular basis because sometimes it's hard to keep the gloves clean than it is Absolutely. to keep your hands clean. Absolutely. And, and carrying hand sanitizer, I know it's hard to come by now, but if you have some at home, keeping it in your vehicle so when you are getting in now, wash, you know, if you don't have the ability to wash your hands because you're on the road, using the hand sanitizer obviously helps as well when you can't wash your hands constantly. So. We talked a little bit earlier about testing. I know a lot of folks have, have asked around the area as far as the drive-up testing is concerned. Why do they need a prescription? Why they, they just can't drive up there like they quit a fast food restaurant and, and get tested? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, that, uh, one, of the, one of the big things when the drive-through testing idea came out, um, obviously you, you hear a lot of rumors on social media, well it's because uh, they won't test you because they don't care about Fayette County, and that's not the case. Uh, the case is that they want to make sure they have enough test kits to be able to test the people that are symptomatic, uh, the people that need the testing get the testing. Uh, obviously our first responders, if they've been contaminated with a known patient, uh, we want them, uh, if they didn't have the opportunity to wear PPE because this was early on to the situation, so the first few cases we had with uh, EMS providers were contaminated in the county or other counties around us, uh, they were quarantined for 14 days to watch their symptoms. 
um, and then be tested if the case arose that they needed to be tested, simply because the fact uh, was that they didn't know they were exposed. Uh, that person didn't present with the normal symptoms that they would have thought. And then they get to the hospital, they develop those symptoms, they become sick, uh, they were tested, they were positive, so now that EMS provider becomes positive and gets tested. So the reason for not being able to just go up and show up at the Kmart parking lot or at the Med Express, uh, they're going to ask you the questions. Do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Do you have flu-like symptoms? Because they don't want to test you if you don't have the symptoms. The other thing, depending on who you talk to, a lot of the doctors and epidemiologists that we've been talking to, uh, you may not be experiencing symptoms, so you may not be have enough in your body that when they test you, it's going to test positive. But in five or six days, you start to get worse, and now they test you and you test positive. So not only have we used one kit, now we've used two kits. Yeah, you could actually go one day and get test negative and come back a couple of days and later and have a positive and test. Positive, right. right. So, so that's one of the big reasons. Spot, and the test kits are limited, so they're trying to you know, use them in a very effective manner. You still have a pretty good supply on hand here in Fayette County, from what you understand? Uh, that's being run through the hospital. So. Okay. And they have, they have told us they had enough to keep continuing operating, so we take it back that they do. Okay. <laughs> we filled their resource requests if they need more. We'll obviously forward that through the state um, to try to get them more supplies for what they need. We've been doing that. We meet every day um, in the afternoon, and we go over our logistical resources for the day on what people have requested, and we vet those resources, and then we send that up to the state level to see what they can fulfill that day for us. And then another thing that bogged you guys down, especially a couple of weeks ago when the governor came out and came out with this list of non-essential businesses forcing a number of business closures in the area is folks were clogging up the 911 system, calling in, reporting non-essential businesses, and that's really not the right way to go about it. Right. The best way to go about it is to, uh, to call the local police department's 10-digit number um, or also call the Pennsylvania State Police's 10-digit number if it's outside of an area that has a local police jurisdiction. Uh, and report that to them. Uh, the state police are going out and checking non-essential businesses when they receive those reports. Uh, we had one instance with a construction company, for example. Uh, people were calling, reporting them as being at work, um, and uh, they went out, the state police went out to check it, uh, and it turned out that it was the secretary at the facility feeding the cat that the, they have at the, the construction company as their pet. So things like that, people call 911 and then we have to take the time to interview the call or transfer it to the state police. So we're asking them to call the 10-digit number for the Pennsylvania State Police, talk to their dispatchers there. Obviously, um, you know, they're going to check it when they get time to. Uh, there are some businesses, like construction companies and others, that are allowed to do emergency work, emergency um, incidents. So somebody's, uh, we just had a windstorm here last weekend. Uh, people had shingles blow off their house, they had siding blow off. Uh, so obviously we want to get that stuff repaired so that when it does rain or uh, we have other weather incidents that we don't end up with more damage. So those are allowable, non-essential. Uh, those are essential at that point then, that non-essential business allowed to perform those emergency repairs. So uh, just getting the word out so people understand that is kind of important. I think folks need to be smart about it as well. I actually saw a situation that occurred earlier on this week where an individual was cited for harassment because he was calling employees at a restaurant telling them that they shouldn't be open and was doing this on a continual basis and they had to get authorities involved and that's not something with everything else going on right now you don't really need that I mean you, there, you could call the authorities as you said don't call an emergency number let them handle it don't try to take these type of situations into your own hands and really make make matters a lot worse. Right now one of the businesses that are essential that are still opening and operating are trying to get the word out to their patrons that, hey, just because you're standing in line at the restaurant, you still want to remember that social distancing course, we talked yes. about earlier in the segment. And, and try to keep that distance of six feet between everybody when they're standing in line to order food or standing in line to pay at the checkout line. I know uh, you go to some of the, the stores, they've got tape down on the floors uh, to, to show you the six feet. They've actually measured it out so people stand in line. Most of the food stores have. They mark the floor, please stay on, and Walmart put a blue dot up. Yeah, that's good. Six feet. So, you know, just big, and you said it best, the people need to understand it, I think, more than anything. It's not the, the store owners or the, the managers of the stores or the restaurants that are to blame for it. It's a people problem, and I think that was what was best related by a few people on, on social media over some of the cases that have been going on. So. How are your first responders all doing? I think this has to be a very stressful time, emotionally, physically, longer hours, I think, for everybody right now with all that's going on. Yeah, I think uh, one of the important things are EMS providers. Um, Physically and mentally are draining from it um, more physically than anything because it is longer shifts. 
Um, we're quarantining EMS providers that have potential contacts and may have been exposed and not known it, uh, which is why we went to the N95s for everybody now. Uh, we have, I know, at least four right now in Fayette County that, that are under self-quarantined at home, monitoring for symptoms. Um, if they develop symptoms, they'll have to be tested. Um, we've had one that was recovered. He, he was affected in another county but lived in Fayette County um, in his full-time job. And uh, he's home. He, well, he actually went back to work last week. He was off for about uh, two and a half weeks. Um, he didn't know he had got it. His patient wasn't uh, experiencing any symptoms that made him think about it. Uh, he found out two days after his shift that he needed to self-quarantine. He was tested, tested positive. Um, he's made a full recovery now. Um, so, but it, it does mentally play on a lot of people that work on the trucks every day. Um, physically, they're exhausted. And, and then the fire service, um, not knowing what they're coming up to on vehicle accidents. The police not knowing what they're going to, if it's a robbery in progress. Uh, because one of our problems is, um, while the Department of Health tells us we have 20 cases in uh, Fayette County, we don't know where those 20 cases are at. So we can't even tell a law enforcement officer that's going to a house for a burglary in progress if that's somebody who is infected living in that house. Has there been any talk as far as being able at least to transmit some of that information to first responders and, and folks that are really in a critical need situation like so we've, you? So uh, we've been in touch working regionally with our regional partners, um, with the Department of Health trying to get that information, even if it's by municipality at this point. Um, we've had West Virginia Department of Health be able to share with us some employees that worked outside of Fayette County in Montague County, West Virginia. They were able to give us name, address, um, and where these people were infected at at their employer. Uh, so we were able to track that and let responders know, hey, if you go to this residence, um, this is a positive case for sure. Uh, but we can't get that cooperation, obviously, with our own health department right now, and that's something we're working with yeah, we, uh, politically. Yeah, we've discussed that with our state senator and reps and, and uh, even, even uh, Senator Casey's office that, that they need to help us uh, with that and get the Department of Health to at least give us the address where that, that person is. And we can flag that in our CAD system. So if that comes up, hey, it's possible there's a case there. I think the public was asking for that as well, especially when this first started. You just had a fewer number of cases around, so they kind of right. knew some of the hot spots to avoid out there. And as Jimmy said, there was there was two residents from here that got exposed in, in uh, West Virginia through their work and they're self-quarantined at home and they get they called and gave us that information kept us up to date they gave us their address and stuff so we have that and you know what's if they can do it why can't Pennsylvania do it yeah why why the pushback do you think it's more HIPAA related more than anything well I don't I don't know I don't know if the Department of Health has, has taken a firm stand on it now I know through our regional partners especially the city of Pittsburgh they're really pushing for that and they are I think just now starting to get some of that through the Allegheny County Health Department. Being we don't, don't have a Fayette County Health Department, maybe that's a difference, but they still could release that address to us. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for everybody. Flag. For sure, for sure. And then we could tell we could tell the EMS, the fire departments, the police departments, hey, we got a we got a possible case there. Just be careful. From a preparation standpoint, do you ever imagine something like this occurring here locally? No. We over the years through our, our uh, connection with our regional task force and our partners in southwestern Pennsylvania, we've done exercises with the Department of Health on uh, points of distribution if we had to, you know, push out pills for uh, some type of, a, you know, uh, event and different things, but nothing at this magnitude. And of course we have the stay-at-home order that's in effect, and I think a lot of folks get confused about that. Of course the stay-at-home order went into effect for the entire state. We did not have that in effect earlier on this week in Fayette County. What's the difference between don't going out, not going out for, for non-essential activities, and now the stay-at-home order, which has been issued? So, um, and, and that's one of the things that we've struggled with ourselves from an agency standpoint is, uh, you know, it was a don't go out unless it's essential to go out. Um, and, and our kind of internal joke with that was we were at a stay-at-home order, now we're at a really stay-at-home order. Because we didn't know how, the, how else to explain it to people that were asking us that. Um, obviously, you know, the, uh, the next step was really a quarantine from, from involving having the National Guard in, things like that, would be really the only next step that they could get to, I think. And, and really, the, the stay-at-home order is a you need to practice that yourself, and you need to be disciplined enough to be able to, as like Roy said earlier, uh, if you have to do groceries, make that grocery trip for a week instead of 
oh, I need to get out of the house, I'm just going to go to the grocery store and walk around and pick up a couple items. Uh, you know, you're going out, you go to work, because some of us still have to go to work, but after work, go to the grocery store, get the stuff you need for the week, uh, and then come home and, and cook your meals, and or go pick up dinner, whatever you're going to do, and then go back home. And we've even seen some states, of Florida started doing it earlier in the week, and I think West Virginia has even taken it up a notch as well, where they're going to watch people from outside the area coming into certain municipalities inside of the state of West Virginia to try to make sure that they're not spreading from an area that might be a hot spot. Yeah, I think one of the big things and concerns for everybody is those transient people coming from other um, states specifically that are hot spots um, where states don't have a lot of cases, but then people start coming from areas that have higher populated states and they're trying to go to, to campgrounds and things like that just to get out of the area that they live in to be safe and they may be carrying it and they don't know it. We touched on a little bit earlier, we see the sun shining in here, it's supposed to be a beautiful weekend. What can the folks go out and do? And I think it's important to stress once again as far as the safe social distancing in terms of recreation. Yeah, I think, you know, going to the park and, and taking a walk on the Sheepskin Trail or any of the other trails in your local area, um, obviously going um, and just walking in your neighborhood um, and taking that nice leisurely stroll as long as you're with your family and you're social distancing from other people. Um, and I mentioned I went last night, I, I walked from my house in Uniontown down, took a walk down the Sheepskin Trail and back home uh, with my babies and, and my sister and, and uh, my nephew that's in from Ohio visiting us. Uh, we went just for a leisurely walk through the neighborhood and down the trail and, and you could see everybody was just walking and, and riding their bike and uh, nobody was actually congregating and talking and if you seen somebody you knew you said hi and you kept walking. Um, and I think that's the most important thing is keeping that social distancing. Uh, one of the things Roy had elaborated to earlier is the state park system. Uh, you know, we said about Ohio Powell. Uh, we've seen pictures from, from several weekends. The last two weekends was beautiful out. Uh, 500 people to 1,000 people congregating in the park. Um, and we spoke to the park, and obviously they can't close the border of the park down right now. Uh, so their bathrooms aren't open. Uh, so you know, just kind of thinking about what people can do, just go up there and walk the trail if you're going to go hiking or biking. Um, but then obviously keeping that six-foot social distance from each other. And I know there was some talk even on a national level as far as closing down some of the national parks as well. Yeah, and that's been the, the, the hard spot, um, I think, is, is politically how do they do it and, and what resources do they have to be able to do that. Because um, it's physically hard to close the borders on a lot of them because people can walk into them and things like that. So. And, and I don't really think all of us in uncharted territory right now with this really occurring in the outbreak here over the last three weeks, certainly dealing with some situations that we've never had to deal with before. Right. right. Anything else you guys would like to add? It's great information from the Fayette County Emergency Management Agency. I think back to the first responders, one thing that we're noticing too, and, and keeping your local volunteer fire departments in mind, most of them have had to cancel their fundraising events now, uh, whether it's their hoagie sale, whether it's their uh, bingos, their pancake breakfasts, whatever it is that they have to make funds for their fire department. Uh, obviously, most of them canceled everything through for March and um, April, um, not knowing what's going to happen in May and, and so forth. So, obviously, keeping those folks in, in mind and uh, when this is lifted, supporting local businesses, local restaurants, uh, and your local fire departments, I think is a big deal. Uh, there's been some legislation uh, that's been introduced by local uh, representatives and senators to try to give some help to those fire departments as well. That would be great. If, if, some, if people get on board with their local representatives and support that for the emergency responders, that would be great because uh, they're obviously going to need that assistance to keep running and, and making those 911 calls and, and keeping the lights on in the buildings. Yeah, we've actually seen a number of community events canceled, actually even through May. National Pike Days were canceled earlier on this right. week for probably the first time, at least since I've been around the area. Right. Um, so it's, it's sad to see, but by the same time, I think, uh, a lot of these measures necessary with what's going on right now. Right, right. and I think it's a lot of hard decisions by the planners. I, I sit on the Salvation Army Advisory Board, we canceled our bunny hop race, and got a lot of feedback from people that we shouldn't have did it, but that was a month ago before we had to order shirts and everything, and not knowing what this week was going to bring, it would have been this coming Saturday. So we were glad we did that decision, we didn't lose money then obviously making that proactive decision. And I think with Easter weekend, certainly uh, tough for a lot of folks around the area, because it's usually a time when everyone likes to get together. Right. Yep. And I, I just add, again, go to the county website to get up-to-date information and use common sense. You know, stay home, make those uh, trips to the stores less frequent, and use common sense and stay home, and, and we'll all get through it.
Roy Shipley, Jim Bittner from the Fayette County EMA. Great information, as always. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here at Inside South Union Township. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Inside South Union Township, Bronx Show is a joint cooperative venture featuring township supervisors Bob Schiffbauer, Rick Fernand, and Jason Scott, Atlantic Broadband Cable, Armstrong Cable, and our friends at CUTV, including Gary Smith. Again, all of our broadcasts available on YouTube by searching South Union TV. You could also follow the South Union Township Network on Facebook as well for program updates, facebook.com slash South Union TV. For Jerry DuPay behind the camera, this is Brian Morozak. Stay safe and have a great day.